Okay. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to a Real Time Crisis Hub. Hope everyone had a nice lunch. We'll try to get back together here. I know there's a few people still missing. Hopefully, they can quietly, discreetly enter while we begin. I'd like to uh, introduce the panel. In the center here, we have Anne Marie Batten. She's a registered nurse. Anne Marie has been a registered nurse for 16 years. She attended both the University of Toronto for a Bachelor of Health Sciences and Serving College in Peterborough. Anne Marie began her career in emergency nursing and then moved to the Durham Region Sexual Assault Domestic Violence Center. This led to further training in forensic nursing and the development of a specialty in crisis work. Anne Marie has been a mental health crisis nurse in both hospital settings and in the community. Currently, she provides crisis outreach support to street involved communities in downtown Toronto. Anne Marie is the chairman of the board of directors for the Bad Date Coalition, a group who assists with healthy and safety of street involved women. Anne Marie also provides crisis management consultation to assist victims of human trafficking. Anne Marie began to incorporate social media into her practice and a collaboration was formed with Constable Scott Mills from the Toronto Police Services. Anne Marie and Scott have identified existing gaps in the services and have been successful in the development of innovative ways to provide online crisis intervention. This they are saving and improving lives through social media. Our second presenter here is Constable Scott Mills. I know that some of you have probably heard Scott before. Uh, Scott has been employed as a police officer for 23 years and is currently assigned to the position of social media officer in the Toronto Police Services, Corporate Communications Office. That is, you are still the only person with that kind of a title, right? Uh, we have a team, but I'm with that real title. Yes. <laughs> he volunteers as a social media advisor for community-led crime stoppers programs in partnership with the police and media nationally and internationally. Scott is a serving board member on the Spanish Speaking Education Network, Community Advancing Values Environments and the Ontario Gangs Investigators Association. Scott began his career in 1990 with the Peel Regional Police and transferred to the Toronto Police Services in 2002. He has experience in community policing, a school liaison officer, homicide squad, intelligence unit, street crime unit with the gangs, and crime stoppers program. Community collaboration is the key to success and safety, and social media tools are a must to accomplish these goals using a relationships and technology strategy. That's his quote. Scott is currently working with the community partners for education and medical sectors in real-time crisis center that envisions the use of relationships and technology strategies and social media to save lives, especially for people experiencing mental health and homelessness issues, and to reduce the 911 calls and hospital emergency room visits. Scott's passion is working with youth in the theme of graffiti art, BMX bikes and community building. He has long been long involved with these initiatives and celebrating them on social media for successes and safety. He is also passionate about further investigations and prevention efforts for the missing and murdered Native women. In 2013, Scott was awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award for community service assisting victims of murdered youth. And finally, on our panel here, we have Ryan Mason, a probation and parole officer in the Northumberland Canteen. Probation and parole office. Ryan graduated from York University in 2004 and later that year started his career as a probation officer, having worked at the Belleville, Durham East, Trenton, Peterborough, and Northumberland probation and parole offices. Ryan has always felt it was necessary to build strong relationships with community justice partners and continues to foster these relationships. In April of 2011, Ryan was asked to take over the webmaster duties for POAO and now sits on the provincial executive as a policy director. In January 2013, 
following Scott Neal's request for POAO involvement, Brian joined the Real Hub Crisis Team, Real Time Crisis Hub, to assist those in need who reach out for help online. Brian was honored in joining this working group on what is now Real Time Crisis Hub. I welcome you all, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing everything you have to say. Thank you. <laughs> So, as was indicated, um, back to well, a lot of people will know Scott came and spoke at our conference last year in Markham on, the, on Monday, and that really started the relationship between POAO and and Scott initially. And so, I believe it was in January, uh, the POAO Twitter account received a direct message because that's how Scott. Uh, asking us to become involved with what was at the time called the Success and Safety Relationships Technology Center Working Group. Um, thankfully, that name has been significantly <laughs> reduced because uh, I can never, I'm always looking to someone to make sure that I get that one right. Uh, so I begged and pleaded to be the POAO representative, um, knowing what they were all about and, and uh, the fact that. Um, you know, I really, what Scott's message to us last year really resonated with me as far as uh, social media and the importance of using uh, technology. And so I was allowed to do that. What worked out really, really well was, again, with technology being sort of the forefront of the organization, um, I didn't have to travel to Toronto for the meetings. I could jump on a Google Hangout. Um, so today is the first time I've ever met Amory in person, although we've chatted a million times online. Uh, maybe not a million, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but several <laughs> times online. And um, it, it's worked out really well to be able to sort of bridge some of those geographical and, and family issues that uh, sometimes result in people not being able to attend meetings. And uh, so, yeah, so the real time crisis, that's how QA got involved. Uh, and I think it's, it's an organization that is very uh, working on a lot of the same with a lot of the same clientele that we would see in our offices. And I think it's it's time that an organization like this uh, comes to the forefront. And, and I think it's great that POAO is right sort of at the, the cusp of this. And we'll really be able to uh, to see this right from, from the get-go. So that's how POAO became involved. And uh, that's all I have to offer. The rest is, is <laughs> I say, I'm, I'm taking up like literally 0.3 of this presentation because these guys are way more interesting than me. <laughs> <clears throat> so ba basically, uh, how we want to do this? We want to have some fun. You guys up for that? Yeah. We want to have it real open and lively. Yeah. Right now, we got a live stream right to YouTube, so we probably can't say exactly what's on our mind. <laughs> uh, but we'll get there because we're going to turn it off at some point. You guys okay with that? Uh, we might even stand up <laughs> once we're not. We're, we're live broadcasting YouTube through that webcam. We've got a little uh, uh, quality audio system that's coming in through here. And um, it's on what's called a Google Plus Hangouts on Air. So if you go on YouTube right now and there's somebody outside of the room or somewhere that wants to hear it, you can just tell them uh, to go on YouTube and, and watch it. And uh, once it's done, once we do finish this part of it, uh, it'll still be there for you to watch. So what we, what we thought we'd do is we do a little bit of a of a reference, um, the introduction, obviously, of, of who we are and what we're doing and why we want to why we want to speak with you, uh, and why we're going to ask for your help. <laughs> um, and uh, then Anne Marie's going to run through some uh, some slides, uh, the kind of boring part. And then we're going to turn this camera off. And I think we're here. What time are we here until uh, Ryan? Is it four? Four thirty. Four thirty. So we're here till four thirty, which is uh, about over almost three hours we're going to be together. So we're hoping we can hash some things out and really get into some good dialogue um, about how we can take things forward and take it forward together. Um, I may be a little bit distracted uh, because we've got a, uh, I'm, I'm behind the Toronto Police Twitter account today uh, off of the phone right here. <laughs> and uh, I'm a bit distracted with what's going on in Toronto right now. Um, so I'm getting uh, things uh, <laughs> uh, sent at me left, right, and center, and I'm monitoring the Toronto Police Twitter account, so I'm really glad Anne-Marie's going to be able to take, take this ball and run with it. 
Um, what's what's really ironic is in the middle of that whole uh, smuzzle that is going on um, uh, in Toronto uh, today. Um, I guess you call it reputation management issues, uh, investigative issues, everything, every issue that can possibly be confronting uh, a police service in a city are probably confronting it today. Um, there is a man that's tweeting from the street saying, I've just run into a person experiencing homelessness. And uh, I think that he may be experiencing some mental health issues and he's hearing voices in his head. Is there anybody that I can reach out to uh, for help when I see this gentleman the next time? And he's tweeting that. So everywhere where it's coming in, asking the Toronto Police for comment on what's going on with their mayor, uh, we have citizen sending something in saying, I'm experiencing um, some concern about somebody that I see on the street, but he only shows up at a certain spot at a certain time, stuff like that. And what I was able to do is engage him in dialogue on Twitter and say, street nurse Anne Marie Batten uh, actually would reach out and help him. And here's her phone number. <laughs> um, here's her email address. Um, let's connect. And I'm able to ask that person, do you think that he would be uh, feeling more comfortable talking with a nurse than a police officer? Because here's both our cell numbers. If he wants to talk to me, um, I can kind of look at it from a police perspective and then I'll work together with Anne Marie. And to me, that's what this is all about. And what we want to do is get probation officers involved in that loop because it, it's no secret who, who we need to help out there and we all know who they are, but we need to be connected in kind of real-time fashion these days because of how quickly social media works to save and improve lives. Th that's essentially what this is. And um, it doesn't take that much time to connect. Um, that that gentleman tweeted at me um, just when I arrived in Hamilton about an hour and 15 minutes ago, and he's now tweeting at the Toronto Police with you know close to 60,000 followers on Twitter saying, "Thanks very much. I didn't realize this service was available. I feel much better about it. I've passed your phone number, your cell phone number, as a police officer." and Anne Marie's cell phone number as a crisis nurse working out on the streets along to the security guard that is uh, at the spot where this gentleman shows up quite frequently and he'll be able to pass along the message when he shows up. So that's kind of how Anne Marie and I roll. Um, it does get a lot more complicated than that and we'll, we'll probably talk about it a little bit more when we're not on YouTube um, but I am prepared to say on YouTube that Anne Marie and I met from a man named Mark Horvath in Los Angeles who was using Twitter to try and end homelessness uh, on an advocacy campaign. So somebody in Los Angeles introduced two co-collaborators because of Twitter uh, that now work collaboratively in Toronto and we're sitting here talking to probation officers saying let's all work together. So it's like a common hailing frequency that's, that's really happening in our lives for the good. So we really want you to see all this that we're about to talk about for the good. Um, and uh, I also, what I want before Anne Marie kind of takes the role over here, and I'm going to kind of run her slides for her and make sure that the slides get into the video so people watching the video can see the slides. So we're going to we're going to share the screen with the slides and stuff. Um, I want you to know that in any major protest that you're seeing that's in Toronto, uh, that ends up on your TV screens like uh, the Occupy movement or I don't know more or something like that, Anne Marie's often on the ground. As a, as a medic and she's out there in the middle of it all and she sees what what's happening and how it's happening and she's not on the police side she's she's not on the protester side she's on the side of keeping everybody safe and for everybody to have kind of lawful people peaceful protest and in order in order for that to be accomplished when when she's in her role you need communication with a number of different people in a number of different ways and Amory is the most effective person that I've seen ever in the entire world to use that to, to use this communication and integrate it because generally the people that are kind of involved in all that they, it, it becomes adversar adversarial instead of conciliatory Amory's managed to pull it together so it's conciliatory in her little world and her little world gets bigger once she uses Twitter to do that 
Um, and it's mostly Twitter, but there's all social media platforms. Facebook is huge um, for connecting with people, probably be bigger, uh, bigger than Twitter. Uh, not probably, it is bigger than Twitter, but Twitter is kind of where everything kind of happens and moves, and Facebook is kind of where it kind of falls. And, and it, it's, it's about connecting with people. And uh, so Emery has this idea. I'm totally behind her as a kind of a police advisor, and so is a number of people at Toronto Police Service that are on the inside looking out, and we want to make this work. And so Emery's going to take it over. Thanks okay. for being here, Emery. <clears throat> okay, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to, to be here and have all of you here to share this with us because, as we were discussing before this started, we had been a real-time crisis hub. The real-time crisis hub the hub portion was actually a community center that's being built for follow-up support. But as I just shared with Ryan, all of our community partners, you're the hub. And if we can get this working successfully, you're going to be out there using Twitter and using social media. And you are actually our virtual hub for both inbound referrals and outbound referrals is how this is going to work. Because we're, we're really a crisis service, but we need to be able to, to give back to you for ongoing management in the community. So I'll just explain how we started. And one thing, if you take anything away, is just collaboration. That's 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 what I'm all about, and I think it's a really important take-home message and that we all need to learn to really collaborate. So the background of this started, as Scott shared, with me working as a street nurse and him as a Toronto police officer. We started out helping a man who was homeless. His name, his hashtag was Homeless Joe. He chose that himself. We used his story publicly with his permission as a way of advocacy and also just a way to be able to reach out and involve more community partners than I could in my normal day-to-day -day street nurse role. In my normal street nurse role, I can only go between River Street and Bay Street in Toronto, Bloor in the water. So that's a very limited amount of folks that I can help. And by working along with Scott and sharing information on Twitter, I've actually been able to go outside of what we would call our catchment and have a much greater success. So we started out, Scott and I, a year ago, right around this time, just having a conversation about frustrations in the nursing world, frustrations in the policing world, what the barriers were, and how to fix what we see as a broken system. So we knew it was bigger than just us talking. So we formed a working group, a focus group, and we reached out to different experts to bring them in. And that's how we were fortunate to get Ryan. So we reached out, we brought in probation, we brought in community mental health. We have a worker from the Community Mental Health Association in Oshawa on our team. We brought in legal, we brought in education. Most importantly, we brought in folks who have lived experience because we really needed their voices to help shape our decision making going forward. And we met month by month and decided what we needed to do, put a structure in place. And as we've moved forward now, we, we've been fortunate to get some legal, some legal support from BLG. We've been very kind in Toronto, um, Gordon Ladner Gervais, and they've actually assisted us a great deal with our legal work. So we are now officially a not-for-profit incorporation, and we're seeking charitable status as well. So it, it's been a year, but in some ways it seems like a long time, and in some ways it's, it's really moved ahead quite quickly. So just some statistics. I, As we all work online, I was home in my kitchen one day watching Scott train the youth and policing kids, and I was listening in on YouTube and writing stats as he was talking, and he asked the kids how many in the class had smartphones. 98% had smartphones. 100% of the kids in that room had experienced a traumatic event, be it violence in their family, school lockdown, death. They, it, we weren't identified what the kind of traumatic event was. 68% of the kids in that, in that room had Twitter accounts. And that really gave me cause to think, how would they reach out in an emergency if they were in a lockdown and they couldn't call for help, they could actually tweet silently for help. And that, that, that day stuck with me. And we, we've included it in our presentation. 
So a study in 2012 by the American Journal of Public Health has identified suicide as the leading cause of death by injury. In fact, has surpassed traffic deaths during the last decade. That's a staggering stat. And suicide ranks 11th for all deaths, considering medical conditions. And suicides have increased 15% over the past 10 years. And what we're seeing in our society now is just a greater use of smartphones, tablets. It's one of the most prevalent forms of communication. We know this. It's using and growing. And Twitter, in fact, users send over 400 million tweets each day. I think there's a stat about age too, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, the fastest growing age demographic on Twitter is the 55 to 64. <laughs> they are yes, they off. are. Yeah. That, that, <clears throat> that is actually happening. And uh, yeah, it is happening that, that they're, they're moving on to another platform, but not, not completely. Um, so I, I did not get this stat. This is one of our <laughs> board members. Social media has overtaken porn as the number one activity on the web. Basically, if you look at all the, the, the traffic on social media sites, that's what it's designed to say. That, like, porn is a huge internet issue on the internet, uh, and, and uh, there's a lot of discussion on it, a lot of things that are posted on it. Social media is bigger than it now. And 25% of smartphone users, 1844, said they can't recall the last time their smartphone wasn't next to them. <clears throat> I have two phones. I know exactly how stressful that is. Ryan's moving his phone away very, very quickly. So what is RTC? So RTC is real-time crisis. And this picture was actually taken for an article that we had in the Toronto Star a while back. I can, <clears throat> I can introduce the folks in the picture. Um, on the right is JC Lamb. She's an education leader. Behind her is Josh. He's a Go Transit safety officer. And then you'll see Scott, myself. Behind me is a young man named Andrew Stewart with lived experience and has contributed significantly to the real-time crisis. We have Paisley Ray in the green sweater. She's a community member. And Claire Cosley is also a community member. And Claire is looking at putting the community center in place that we were talking about earlier, the hub, to give people a place to go of significance here. <laughs> I, I believe, yes, if you look at the computer on, on Scott's screen, from the left, the bottom, I think we actually had a Google Hangout, which, which is it's pretty amazing. Ryan was in the picture and in the Toronto Star. Also, you can see Scott Abrams' face on there. He's one of our board members from Crime Stoppers USA. But we, we wanted the whole team in the picture, and there was no way to get the whole team. So we brought everyone who wasn't in Toronto in on Google Hangout. So we were actually able to include everyone. So essentially what this is, and this, this goes into what our vision is for for all this. So what you're looking at in that, that picture and what you're looking at in real life here is just a laptop computer. And it's got an internet stick on it. And you can see the internet stick in the picture. And essentially what we're doing here where we're live broadcasting to YouTube, you can get up to 10 people on what's called a Hangout. You can either be live or to YouTube or not be live to YouTube and just talk, kind of like Skype. Um, so we dialed in all of our board members for this picture on there and held them up and they were physically talking back and forth to the photographer and things like that. So that's, uh, we get tweeted at a lot of times and, and Facebook posts a lot of times onto the Toronto Police uh, um, social media sites uh, as well as Crime Stoppers social media sites that basically have a, a real time crisis issue like I'm going to go jump in front of a train right now. And that's why Go Train people are thinking about the necessity of getting in. And it, it's not Go Transit officially; it's the Go Transit safety officers. They, they're they're up and running on Twitter. And before the end of the day, I'll show you where they're at and how you can connect with them. And the whole idea is that if we get one of these that comes in, say on the smartphone right now, that somebody's saying that, and it comes to our attention, whether it be like somebody's letting us know or somebody actually tags us in something, we do the the how this would work was with on the front end we'll try and bring it off of social media so that you don't have like a suicide going on in front of all these people 
um, but sometimes you can't do that. But it's better to go from Anne Marie, uh, who's got fewer followers, than it is from going from the Toronto Police account. Plus, it's better to have a nurse doing it than a cop. So you can see all the benefits and things like that uh, going forward. And the whole idea is, is all I would have to do if this were set up appropriately um, with the proper staffing levels and the proper funding and, uh, and structure like, like we're advocating for is I would just reply with hashtag real time crisis at real time crisis and the team would be on it and they would be doing everything. What this Google Plus Hangout would accomplish is we would have partners like yourselves and, and Ryan's a really good one on, behalf, on your behalf right now that are completely set up in your role. So if we found out that somebody was on probation and you know a lot about them, well, we would have that network in place on the back and we would just contact you saying we need to talk to you and share our screens like we're doing right now with this presentation to see what's up and see what we need to do. And we're able to reach the people at GoTrain to stop the trains like immediately, just like that. So everybody be integrated. Um, and that's the kind of goal. And this needs to be done on a worldwide basis because sometimes the issues that are coming to us are coming uh, from other provinces, other cities, other countries, and halfway around the world. So we need to be able to connect directly with the uh, emergency responders plus the social service providers. And it's it's much easier to do it face to face like, like it's in that picture. That's why we took the picture like that, because we want to explain how this works. And it, that, it does sound complicated to somebody who's not really used to that environment. Um, but once you're used to the environment and you have the infrastructure set up, it's really easy. And it's it's kind of like you know you know when you get the feeling in your heart like oh my gosh what do I do? Um, you don't you don't have that feeling anymore because you have this entire infrastructure behind you that you know what to do, and you know that they're going to be there 24/7. But we're not there yet, so <clears throat> I'm going to back over to Anne Marie here to get through this. Okay, so as I discussed, we're we're seeking charitable status. Uh, what will actually set us apart? There are a lot of Twitter users who are out there right now that are doing this sort of work on a support basis. But what what we're really seeking and what, what will set us apart is, as we say, we're, we're real professionals operating in real time, meaning that we'll be nurses, social workers, folks with a background that can actually do a more substantial mental health assessment. So we are going to put professionally trained staff on the front lines to do this work. We're going to begin our operations in Toronto and Canada, but as Scott has said, we, we've already, I, I've assisted a girl in Edmonton, we've had a case in Texas the other day, so we've already been working down into the states. So it, there is potential for this to go global eventually, but for now, it's all we can do is just, just wanna, start in Toronto. I just want to touch on something about why it needs to be international. There, there's also an issue between real and, and a hoax. Uh, believe it or not, there are hoaxes and in, in, in relation to suicide that happened and we dealt with one recently uh, where we had somebody uh, in, in our community in Toronto that was actually doing research on suicide and social media and she typed in the hashtags uh, suicide on, on Twitter and came up with what appeared to be a real-time crisis situation where a young girl who it would appear to be in New York um, was saying that she was going to take pills and, and kill herself and her mother didn't know and all this type of stuff and that person started reaching out and people try to do this all the time like Emery alluded that that there's people uh, many with lived experiences that are out there helping trying to help others we we know uh, from a lady named um, Sandra who tweets as unsuicide she's one of those people she's been doing this for for a number of years and she's identified 500 people in the world that actually do this from a non-professional basis and their biggest problem is when they need to actually trace a tweet and try and geo pinpoint someone or chase a trace trace somebody down in an emergency because there's a real danger. They they can't get law enforcement to act because there's a training issue and, and, and resource issue and things like that. And uh, even more great of greater importance where you're concerned is they can't reach the social services they need because by policy they're told they can't use social media. And, and so there's also the Monday to Friday office hours thing. So what this is designed to do is not reinvent the wheel, but add a spoke to make it stronger. 
and and just go in and provide that training and provide that link for after hours coverage and stuff like that. So on that one particular hoax, um, it, it turned out to be a hoax this particular one, but that wasn't after we um, engaged in our exigent circumstances uh, where there's death or grievous bodily harm that's going to happen. Um, I triaged it as a police officer. Anne Marie was triaging it as a nurse. We both decided we needed to act on it. Uh, a lot of times we do these decisions without even talking to each other because we know we know what, how each other is going to act out there because we're so used to working together. And um, and I basically initiated a trace through our Toronto Police Communications um, call taker supervisors. So basically, I. I got the person that was seeing everything to send me an email with all the copies in it and ensure that as they know this particular person knew how to copy the tweet so that you got the tweet ID because each individual post has its unique ID number and that's what you need to trace. But you can't just go trace something. You, you got to have a threat of death or bodily imminent bodily harm. So we did that through the dispatcher. As soon as they get that IP address back, um, they actually have to do another check on the service provider in the, in the in the area. So when we started doing that part of it, that becomes our intelligence bureau that's doing that, and and they they actually uh, started doing an analysis of this Twitter account and related Twitter accounts to it, and made a determination that this was a hoax, and that it was actually a ploy to try and get. Uh, a pop singer's album to trend on Twitter that was going to be released five days later. And the reason why they were able to determine that is because it was uh, a proxy. Uh, it was the, the IP was coming back to a proxy address out of Greece. So we figured that we knew who was behind it. Uh, it was probably a marketing company associated to the pop star. Um, and the account after we went out, I said we got a we've got a huge issue now, and you guys will have this too. <laughs> um, that we have a huge issue because now people are going to report this to anywhere, anywhere in the world. That's why it needs to be global, because they're seeing it and they're following it, and the, and so you're going to have duplicity of efforts to try and help all over the place. So they'd actually even created a hashtag in this particular case. Uh, that was remember me after I'm done after I died and RIP type thing and so I just went on I talked to all our proper people on the Toronto Police Communications end and uh, said we need to actually tweet into that hashtag as Toronto Police official you know officially say that we've investigated it believe it to be a hoax so that other people don't report it so then shortly after that the account tweeted that yes this is a hoax the next thing you know, we had media from all around the world. Like within a minute of me posting that tweet on the Toronto Police Twitter account, I had CP24 producers calling me, and it just went international after that. People just kept calling, calling, calling. What's this all about? So the moral of the story is: yes, we need to be international. We need to and and we need to be really working together, and it works quick. And you need a communications and an investigation strategy and you need to be linked with your social services. Because if it is real, chances are you might not need a police officer dispatched. You might be a person that we all know, getting back to what I said earlier. It might be a person we all know and have a file on and know what their trigger points are and, and how we can help them. And if we're networked into that somehow, then the real-time crisis people can take it over without having to dispatch a police car. And wouldn't that be wonderful if we don't have inquests because police officers end up shooting people experiencing mental health uh, illness and crisis? So I, I think that's the the ultimate mm -hmm. goal. So sorry for jumping in. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, Marie. No, not too bad. Okay. <laughs> next. Yeah, next. So I'll just we'll just go through these quick. So we want to be the recognized leader in real time intervention while becoming leading authority regarding positive and negative effects of social media communications during traumatic events. What that means is that we want to be a go to. We're starting this grassroots. We're learning as we go along, but we want to put real professionals in those roles. We want to have the expertise to be able to go out and to train community partners so that we're all doing this in the same way so that we can all work together. The positive and the negative sides are, as Scott said about the hoaxes, we want to be able to teach how to assess that and also negative sides around bullying and 
the negative sides around safety, around, um, for example, domestic violence, uh, teaching people about erasing, erasing the tracks and, and such. That's really the negative side. This one? No. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. <laughs> okay. So, that's something like that. so as I said, connecting real-time professionals and real-time interventions. And we're empowering and promoting safety and successful outcomes through engagement and developing trusted relationships. What the, the take, take home from the, that is around the trusted relationships and in working with, with people. I can give you an example where someone's tweeting suicide to the Toronto Police account where Scott will then put myself or real-time crisis in. After we've had interventions and, and we've helped this person, generally what happens is that that person will then reach out to myself or real-time crisis so that we become the first the first line of response not the police and we know there's gaps that's how our conversation started and I think we're going to talk about that when we turn the YouTube off um, gaps and barriers in doing this in this job but we want to be able to excel at that because we we have some ideas and what we're doing is working we're, we're we're learning there's challenges that we'll discuss but but we seem to have found a way to do it. And we engage people, we do an assessment, which is the mental health assessment, risk assessment, and then we respond to real-time crisis in, in real time. We're developing training, and the training that I'm working on is called EARS. There's a reason for that. Listen more, talk less is kind of the mantra. But in EARS, the E is engage, the A is assess, the R is respond, and the S is safety. And the message of this is about identifying a risk and responding with the appropriate response for the level of risk. So that police officers aren't being sent to the door for minimal risk. These are just our charitable status objects. So there's a few ways that this can work. Sometimes someone may tweet in directly to the Toronto Police. Sometimes it'll be a third party reporting. You might want to look at my, my friend's Twitter. Um, could be a social worker from the school saying, we had a report today at school that a girl's in distress. So th that could come to us. It could come to you in the community. And hopefully when we get this set up then in the community, you'll be referring to us, but we need to have law enforcement on the back end to assist for when we need because we can't we can't do do this by ourselves and that's going to actually set us apart in that we're fortunate to have a partnership with law enforcement. I just want to say one comment about data mining. We're not data mining. Um, I think what what we're 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 in a learning curve ourselves and um, and uh, one of our board members put the presentation together and that presentation is accurate. But the whole data mining thing brings up the Big Brother thing. Um, oh, and, and just to make a like a a point about things that are on the internet, um, it's called open source. So if it's out on if it's out on the internet, it's it's kind of fair game for an investigation. And data mining, how I read this to to read as a police officer here and knowing all the people in the background are, the extent of the data mining that that would go on with this. Is somebody like uh, Josh Rivet at Go Transit, or somebody at Go Train would actually be monitoring the hashtag Go Train and the keywords Go Train to see if any, and they're more they're monitoring it for their brand for for the most part. But when somebody when something comes up that I'm going to jump in front of a Go Train comes on it, then they're going to turn it over. And and there's a really key point. Uh, we 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 have used some software in the past that uses geotags. Um, that actually, uh, so if you don't have your, your geotags turned off on your phone and you put a picture up on, on social media, it'll geotag you to a, a location. So there's software out there where you can, you can get all of these pictures into one, um, like into a, into a thing and see what's being said, right? So we have used it on occasion when we know that somebody's in crisis and they're saying they're going to be on railroad tracks. Um, it has been used. Uh, and we've actually come up with um, uh, evidence 
that shows that the person's not tweeting and sitting on the railroad tracks like they say they are, but they're sitting on the on the church steps. So a it allowed us to de to to downgrade the response, and b it allowed us to find the person so that we could get them into help. So the whole data mining is uh, I, I'm going to change the wording in that on our presentation going going forward, um, but because we want to make really clear distinctions that that's not what it is. And we wouldn't, uh, it'd be great if, if we were partnering up with somebody like Probation Officers Associate, or it wouldn't be POAO, it'd be operational, it'd be like the ministry partnering up with probation officers um, operationally. There may be keywords that we put into this type of thing that we're looking for that we come up as a group to say, you know what, there's keywords we need to look for uh, that could help us prevent a, a tragic situation in relation to certain people. Um, we, we think that's a good thing, um, but is it spying and using it like Big Brother? Absolutely not. You, you, you couldn't, as a police service, have enough resources to do all that, no matter how hard you try. Um, but I think you can do it on a, for the right reasons, and that's basically if there's death or grievous bodily harm. Just like this, it's the same reasons as when you have to go get um, information on an IP address from a social media provider when there's when there's death or imminent bodily harm involved, then yeah, we need to use all tools at our at our at our, um, at our resources. But we're definitely concerned that we don't want to be seen as breaching people's privacy in any way, shape, or form. And and the language on how you describe that is so important. And it's a, it's a learning curve for all of us. So that's why we're working together on it. <clears throat> and just directing. Um, directly engaging with the person. The only thing I would add on about locating people is that when this works properly and you have a trusted relationship and you're engaging with the person, you can learn the location where the person is. Generally, they're going to tell you if they've agreed and they actually want help. In most cases, you don't need to run IP addresses and use those resources. You don't need to bring in other software. If you are actually engaged with someone in real time and they're agreeing to to get help, they'll give you their location. So we're saving resources that way as well. I think we went through that. Safety, of course, is is our primary concern. We are in discussions with Toronto Police because we do want to have a formalized partnership. I did meet yesterday with the Mobile Crisis Intervention team and hopefully we're going to be able to assist there as well just because so many calls do come in that are of a social media nature and it's not to take the work away that anyone's doing now it's just to add the social media component and work in partnership and as a team it's the same for anyone out in the community we all have jobs to do it's just to to add to that I think we went through um, <coughs> So there's target, there are target groups that we think we can really make a difference. Of course, mental health intervention, suicide intervention is, is how this started. And we know that we can make inroads with youth and cyberbullying, which sadly ends up sometimes being suicide calls. Domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. I, I personally have a lot of experience in that area and how I, I brought that in, hoping that we would be able to reach out and respond when girls that are in trouble can't call for help, as long as you turn your keypad off, you can tweet for help silently, you can call silently. And it's good timing right now because in the city of Toronto, we're just building a Toronto Counter Human Trafficking Network and we just had our first meeting last week and that's going to continue and we've got a lot of engaged community partners. So it's really a good time for Real Time Crisis to get involved and offer a form of social media support. <coughs> Yeah, and just, just highlighting again that once someone has had the experience of getting help from a nurse and an officer, even as the man this morning, if he, if he wants to help someone with a homelessness issue again, chances are he's going to reach out to Scott and I and he won't need to be <coughs> tweeting it on a corporate account. Um, case study. So we are going to get into some uh, case studies here. That's the end of our formal presentation. We, we really want to get into some nuts and bolts and 
real real stuff that's going on here. Um, so just before we, we turn this video off and, and uh, kind of get into it, I just want to see if I can't... Uh, here's what we look like there, uh, Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a bit. Um, so that that's how you do. That's like live to YouTube. So and you can bring other people in on it. So sometimes sometimes we'll just reach out and invite. Uh, you just go over here and this is your little dashboard where you can invite other people in, and they can come in and join your dialogue. And you just put a speaker on here and they can be heard. And so we've done that several times. We just felt that there's three of us here today in person. There's no need to really bring in somebody else onto it. Um, but uh, I'd like to kind of just end with this um, and have this out on the, uh, the, the video itself. And this is, um, that's the real-time crisis Twitter account uh, that Amory's got. And so Ryan is kind of tweeting and she retweeted him on there. So that's that's what Amory's real time crisis uh, looks at. That's that's she's retweeted uh, real time crisis appreciate service you provide provided this weekend and always to help people experiencing mental health crisis on social media. That's because we dealt with four four instances of crisis over the weekend, and and Amory wasn't working and I wasn't working. So if you can kind of do the math, um, this this needs some human resources. And some funding, um, and it, it it needs some real key people to put their heads around to say, how can we do this? Um, uh, I've been, I've been, it was said before that I I've, I've been here talking to before about these issues. I've been talking about these issues for a long time, and I, I just got sick of talking about them. Um, and Amory was the action, and let's just we got to do something. We have to put a solution together, not just say here's what the problem is. Here's Here's some viable solutions, and so um, Anne Marie doesn't have funding right now for this. She, she's fully incorporated. Um, BLG is our lawyers; they, they've been kind enough to do all that for her. Um, she's got Lori Stevens on her board of directors, who is the lady out of Boston that is the architect at the Toronto Police Social Media Strategy. Uh, she's a consultant, a, s a civilian with a media background and edu an education background, and now she has a company called Lost Communications, and she does this full time. So today she's in Dallas, and she's trying to do for the Dallas Police Service. She's contracted down there to do what she's done for the Toronto Police Service uh, to to use this social media. So she's on, involved with this on the on the board, and the other one is Crime Stoppers USA, past chairman Scott Abrams, who's got who's got a mental or. Um, He's got a, a background in working at CEO levels at hospitals in the United States, as well as being very involved in Crime Stoppers programs. And and uh, we don't really want this associated with the word crime. However, when you're, I, I'm the Crime Stoppers social media advisor. So when you go out and hang a shingle as probation or as Crime <laughs> Stoppers or as any official agency with any type of credibility, whether you're community or government, um, you you have the risk of somebody posting something to you that's a real time crisis issue, and so we feel that the more people we can partner with, the better. And uh, we feel that probation officers are are overlooked. <laughs> um, we also feel that the Probation Officers Association of Ontario um, are probably the best kind of not for profit collective group of people that are actually doing the work that have an influence on the Ontario government for policy and for funding opportunities and, and stuff like that. So, so we, we want to win your hearts and we want, to, we want to win over your minds that this is something that's necessary to jump on board and how can we work together. So I said that that's what we want for help. So if you, um, uh, how I wanted to finish with is if you put into perspective what uh, the Toronto Police is doing on social media. I think this is a good way to end our little session. Um, we're not where we want to go, but we're getting there and we're getting there fairly quickly. And, and I just want to show you where we're at right now, how it works while we're still on the video um, so that you can think about your own organizations and how we might fit into that. So that's the Toronto Police website. Um, we generally, it's my office that's responsible for putting these stories up in the middle. 
Um, they're generally good news stories or they're of a press conference or something like that that we do as stories, like a blog. Um, we're not really shareable from those sites in the way we want to be, but we're trying to, we're, we're working on new websites. Um, we're doing it all in-house, and, and there's only a few few people involved, and so it does take a long time with an astronomical website like this is. Like, this is a very huge job to fix. So what we did as a short-term solution is we put down that right-hand side there what's called a social stream, and any time that we broadcast a YouTube video, either in the same manner we're doing it right here, um, or I'm on a different channel, I'm not on Toronto Police Channel right now, but if I were on Toronto Police Channel doing what I'm doing now, would ingest right into that front top window. And we've that's called Google Plus Hangouts on Air, doing it from here. We now have a live stream license uh, with YouTube, and anybody can get it if you've got a YouTube account in good standing and you've got a thousand or more subscribers to your YouTube account. In good standing, that means no copyright strikes. And you can get copyright strikes for absolutely anything. You know, if there's a radio playing in the background when you're doing something, and it's, it, it, that'll pick up as a copyright strike. And, and so you have to be very careful with that. We, we've got our license now, and uh, we've integrated into our our feed, but it's still not, we're still not really advertising this huge <laughs> yet because we're still working out the bugs. But we're now using an HD and a codec system uh, to live broadcast right to YouTube. So what you're seeing right here is the Mothers Against Driving Canada 2013 launch that happened in our lobby of our headquarters this morning. It goes right to the YouTube site. So an example of kind of how, how many views something like that gets, um, th this will probably um, really um, uh, hit with you. When our, when our police chief did this press conference there the other day, um, we were doing this, and there was, I was monitoring it, there was oh, about 4,500 people that watched live, and now there's 127,259 views on the, on the chief's press conference there. So that's kind of where we're at. We're hoping that other people can listen, um, especially when it's like a gang thing that the police are involved with, where people are going to be probably that are involved that may be on probation or maybe in and outside of jails and things like that. There, there's a you we all need to know what's going on because it affects the potential for risks of safety of both ourselves and our clients. So we're trying to hope we're hoping that communication improves with all this. And uh, just to go back on here, when you go below the, uh, the the website there, you've got your social feed for uh, Toronto Police right there. And there's about 240 people in Toronto Police that are um, both police officers and civilian members that have taken the two-day Social Media for Communications course at Toronto Police. Um, at our police college, and once they are using social media for their mandate to serve and protect and, and doing it well, the, the rules are simple, don't be stupid, um, then we put them on this loop and it goes into the website. So from here, I can actually you know, tweet something saying we're sitting here talking, watching us live on YouTube, it'll come right to the Toronto Police website right from the phone. So um, we, we think that's really effective in getting a message out. And it's not just like a corporate message. So that, that one, for instance, at the top, Youth and Policing, he's retweeting Ontario Youth. It's flu season. Get a free flu shot. And that's a youth that's working with us, that's empowered to use the Youth and Policing account. And if he's not sure about what he can or, put, can or not put out, he'll come down, he'll reach out, he'll talk, and he'll say, should I do this? Can I do this? And we'll just give him some advice. And he goes... But it's the voice of the youth that's being heard out there, and it goes it goes unfiltered right into the Toronto Police website. So I, I love that. It's it's a basically called a decentralized social communication strategy. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to for traditional people in communications fields that are used to pinching everything. Um, but you can use, feel free to use this as an example. Um, I, I almost fell off my chair, but I was uh, I was very happy the other day when I saw a newscast that Kathleen Wynn, our premier, who was actually broadcasting into schools, and she had 10 schools on a Google Plus Hangout like this, and she's sitting in her office at Queen's Park. I'm like, 
yes, perfect, because now we're actually getting to the people that we want to be able to speak to. And I, I'm telling you, I got a 13-year-old son, and if my 13-year-old son was empowered by his school principal to run a Google Hangout so Catholic, the premier of the province could come in and speak to the school, he'd be all over it, he'd come home, and he'd be the happiest kid in the world. And the teachers that are kind of like, I don't know how to use this, they wouldn't have to worry about it because the kids would figure it all out for them. So, um, uh, you know, that that's a good thing. And, and that that'll that, that helps to overcome some of the issues. I know if my son, if he gets bored, there's problems, <laughs> right? He's not getting bored when he's challenged with that type of stuff. So it, it's about loosening that juggernaut and, and letting more people that are interested in doing it do it. If you don't want to do it, you shouldn't be forced to do it, right, at, at all. So... Um, if you go view more here, it'll give you the last 24 hours of everybody that's tweeted. Um, I like this one that I'm seeing right now from Ryan. Um, his profile picture is the garage door, Ryan CP23. It's the garage door of 23 Division Toronto Police that's actually painted with graffiti art by a graffiti artist. And, and I can tell you that on the inside looking out of that, there are some issues. Even police officers didn't want that it's gang stuff and things like that. It's all about education. It's all about leadership. It's all about working together with people that we've never worked together before, and celebrating with a quick photo. And now it's on his profile picture, and 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 it's connecting with the very people we need to connect with. Uh, this guy Marco Ricciardi, he's in direct conversation with Anne Marie a lot out in the streets because he's a transit patrol officer. He actually uses Foursquare and pinpoints his geolocation sometimes, as well as Twitter and things like that. And, and he's actually been able to apprehend somebody that's actually personating a police officer because he's doing that. Um, so if you're not, I guess the word for that, if you're not out in this space, there's a conversation going on, and if you're not hearing it, um, you're, you're losing potential to reach the very people that we're there to, to, to reach. Um, and it, the worst part is it could affect our own safety because if we're not hearing that, I can't tell you the number of times that something has come in on social media where somebody's tweeting about there's a police car over there and I'm going to go slash its tires or I'm going to, I'm threatening to hurt the officer there and immediately we're onto our communications. Getting a hold of that officer on the radio, uh, let them know that somebody's saying this to be situationally aware. So if you got somebody coming into your your probation office and you're a little worried about them, um, it'd be really good if you had a, a communications and investigation social media strategy in place that was actually monitoring some of this stuff and if they did say something like that and they felt you're at risk that the meeting is you're actually given some, some, some backup, right? So think about it in terms of your own safety and the safety of the people that were, were out there to, to manage as, as the importance of, of why we need to do that. Um, on here, we've, anybody with a Facebook in Toronto Police gets to go on there. This uh, moves a little slower, uh, but we have put an aggregate feed of all the Toronto Police Facebook pages. So who has it? Our divisions have one. A number of individual officers have one. Our 911 operators have one. Today they're saying that they're at the APCO Canada Conference in, in, in Ottawa, and they're hearing Major General... Um, uh, Lewis McKenzie speak and things like that. Before this social communication, decentralized communication strategy, that wouldn't happen because all of our top dogs for communications are involved in another issue today, right? So, but these people are, and like us here, we're allowed to do this. This would go totally under the rug and not be deemed important today because of what's going on today, but it is important and it is being celebrated and we are we are doing what we would do because we've got this in, in place. So the, the back end works completely different. There's a perfect example of where you guys could be involved yesterday for asking people to check their garages, verandas and stuff for this man, um, who is a man that was experiencing some mental health issues and he actually uh, walked away from a hospital. And we were very concerned about him and we needed everybody's help and things like that. So it was going out into this realm. And I could, the, the, when we have a, a case like that, so many people are helping. It, it's absolutely amazing mm -hmm. how many people are trying to help. 
but the people like probation officers and the people that probably have the most knowledge of anybody out there, they're told they can't do it. And and frankly, we need to change that. And and if and if we can have that dialogue today here uh, to try and help change that, that's 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 why we came and, and that's why we're honored to be here. So that's pretty much how it uh, how it works there. And uh, any any final words before we cut the speed? Does anybody out there want to say anything? No questions. Questions? Yeah. I can tell you that um, I worked at Roy McMurtry as a police officer going in to do a project in there and I did a couple of YouTube videos not of kids faces but of their feet and all this type of stuff and, and when I went to the Ontario government uh, that were in charge of communications for that and said can you post this on your site here's the edited video it's all good it doesn't invade their privacy it celebrates success promotes safety they said they need like 13 approvals to do that so the lady just looked at me and said, you might just want to put it on your Toronto Police line. Okay. So uh, is there a dialogue going? I think there's a lot of people saying, yeah, we're, we're way behind the curve here, and we need to get ahead of the curve. Um, Winston Wong is one person um, in, at the Ontario ministry level that's come forward and said, we really want to look at how we can do this. So he's a guy to reach out to. Um, he's in dialogue, I know, with, with me. Um, and, and as well as Anne Marie, and maybe Anne Marie could speak to the nursing profession because it's not just the whole law enforcement and government. Um, I think that's a valid point, and, and Anne Marie maybe could share some of her experiences with the nursing uh, field. Yeah, I can tell you, um, nursing doesn't use social media to engage directly. And in fact, what happens is, and you'll, you'll notice it as you look around, a lot of agencies use social media more in a corporate way to say this is who we are, this is when our fundraiser is, this is what we can do, and it's much more in an advertising type of way. But what you really what you really need to take from that and what the message that needs to get out there is everyone has Twitter pages, Facebook pages, what happens when someone posts an emergency to that page? And what you also find with a lot of those agencies out there, they're admin staff that are running those pages. So it becomes a liability if you don't reach beyond that. And I think we, we really need to have an honest dialogue about how to manage this because at some point, someone is going to realize that you're actually liable if you don't have a strategy to help people. We don't have technology. We don't have the phone. We don't have access to Facebook. We don't have access to the I think we need to do a lot of advocacy and a lot of education and a, a great deal of what we're doing right now even as real-time crisis is going around and speaking to groups just to explain this. I, I've had to overcome huge challenges in the nursing profession and that's why a lot of what I do, my Twitter account is a personal Twitter account and I've been engaging with folks on there. I tweet out where the out of the cold locations are for example. A man said to me, I'm out in the West End. Is there anywhere near near me? Well, technically, I can't help him. He's west of Bay Street. But I was able to bring him into direct messaging, talk to him, direct him to and out of the cold. So I've taken those chances. I have explained to the College of Nurses what I'm doing going forward, and I've kept them in the loop. They at the, They're at the point now where they've said, you're okay license-wise as long as you have documentation, as long as you work within the standards of practice. But that took a lot of advocacy. And I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say, my employer took my phone away. <laughs> my employer, it's a non, non-profit agency that felt that having phones cost too much and cancel my data plan. So I had to go to Kudo and say, you know, I'm a street nurse, I'm out on the streets and I'm, I'm nervous doing what I do, but I don't want to stop doing what I do. And Kudo actually helped me with the phone. So 
I admit I, I've taken some chances. I don't, I don't regret what I'm doing. In fact, I really believe firmly that we need to do, do more of this kind of advocacy. And I, I think with education, we'll make some inroads. Yes. Just for the video, speak into the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later. Um, I, for, from a POA perspective, um, you know, it, the timing for me having to step down from the board recently was unfortunate because of this was something that I was really wanting to take on. Um, so POAO's social media. Uh, Presence has really, it's really fairly new, right? We're it's probably about a year since we started using Twitter. We yeah. just started using Facebook. Um, what we determined was a priority originally was for us to have some kind of strategy. Um, as Anne Marie said, if we're out there and we have, we we may have people who are coming to us. What do we do with that? So as an organization, we came up with a social media policy. To so that people, because we have three POA affiliated accounts. One is the main one, one is East Branch, one is Southwest Branch, right? We needed to have some kind of strategy as a provincial organization as to how to deal with things if they came to our attention. Um, what will, I think, probably, probably will be amended quite shortly to involve a sort of real time crisis, like to, to identify real time crisis as the agency that we will be dealing with. Um, if that kind of stuff comes up, because I think real-time crisis is all that's out there. Um, so the strategy was that strategy was important. That was the first thing that we were undertaking. I think this the next step is to is the advocacy piece. As far as there probably needs to be uh, a position paper or some or something similar um, drafted and and taken to the ministry. And I think that's that's the way to the way to go. Unfortunately, that takes time. And so we aren't there yet. I think it's it's very it's it's definitely at the board's um, or in the board's sight. I think everybody who sits on the board would love to see that happen. A because we haven't really had um, a lot of stuff coming out of policy in the last little while as far as, as far as position papers. I think this is something that the membership would like to see and would like to see POAO advocating for. So yeah, to answer your question, I think the board. Is certainly moving in that direction, um, and I, I can see something coming out as far as uh, advocacy with the ADMs of both ministries. Um, I can see that. Be, I mean, certainly there's been sort of more operational stuff that's been going on lately, sort of responding to some the pace of change, for example, and some of the policies that have come out recently. That's been uh, the the focus of those meetings that that the president and vice president have had with. The uh, the both ADMs, but I think this is probably the next the next thing. So yeah, to answer your question, it's certainly on on POA's uh, to do list, and uh, hopefully will become the priority going forward. And hopefully we'll see something um, soon. Is Tinny? And again, it's not just looking at Facebook to find the places that they can explore when we are truly building our time. They need to have the strategy. Mm -hmm. They're going to get people saying, 
know, they told, she made people tell this time about new jobs. Well, what did somebody respond to say, well, actually, I lost my job, and this is how I'm doing it. What would she do? Yeah. That's a very pointed question. I, I personally, I, I feel that this should be put as a very high top priority in all our organizations for that very reason. Our, we have a responsibility. Too. We have a responsibility. Um, our, our community success and our own safety and the safety of the people that we're tasked to, to help is in jeopardy if we're not there. And um, it's, it, that's, I, I, you know, I, I'm fortunate that in Toronto Police, we had leadership that took the bull by the horn a while ago, and it was only because, the only reason they took the bull by the horn is because they had a few officers out there that were pushing the envelope, myself included. Uh, Sergeant Tim Burroughs was another one that was really pushing it. And, and we were getting more of a voice for the Crime Stoppers program or Tim or myself individually as officers and, and the voices of the, uh, of the organization. We were kind of, we were the voices of the organization really out there. And that's a, that, that's a problem, right? So now with the strategy we, we, um, and, and the, the purpose and the process, and now we're going in and changing all the different procedures that need to be changed to accomplish this because we've realized that the pyramid used to be like this, and now it's like this. And that, that's going to take leadership. And I, I, the way I see it, in, in my experience with Probation Officers Association of Ontario, you're the, you're the Tim Burroughs and the Scott Mills of Toronto Police. You're the people that bring that up. And there's only one other kind of, there's a couple other people out there. There's one in the OPB uh, that, that has really advocated for this and, and not really got where he wants to get. And there's another gentleman by the name of Dean Eastman with the Ministry of Finance uh, out in Oshawa, and he, he does all the uh, um, illegal um, uh, smuggled uh, tobacco investigations and things like that. He's really led a thing like, uh, to saying we need to do this. So those are the only two that have come to my eyes and ears at the Ontario government level. And like I said, I, I see you guys as, as, a, as a bright light on, on that road and you're going to need the position papers, like Brian said. It's going to take people saying, we need to do this because, uh, you know, I hate to say it, our safety is at risk. And uh, I just talked to Women in Corrections uh, last week, and I'm talking again to their second group uh, next week. And once the camera's off, maybe we'll have that same discussion. <laughs> but uh, I think their eyes and ears were open saying, you know what, I'm with you. Not against it anymore, but like uh, you know, quite frankly, I've been saying this since 2004, and you know, uh, the Secretary General of Interpol, after he did a presentation in South Africa in 2008, in November 2008, put an international press release out saying that police services need to use social media to track fugitives. Well, I had an hour and a half presentation that talked a lot more than tra tracking fugitives. It talked about this. That was 2008. We're now in 2013, and we're still sitting here talking about how we're going to build this. So I think we really need to... Uh, I, that's why uh, I think uh, there's another man named Patrice Cloutier in the Ontario government for emergency management, and, and he's very, pretty modest. He can be outspoken at times on things, and I'm sure he's tipped over the apple cart a few times. Um, but the bottom line is, he's told me before, he said, I, I got tired of, of sitting on the sidelines. So he said, all I can do is just try and change my little world. And I think that's what Anne Marie's tried to do. That's what I've tried to do. That's what Brian's trying to do. That's why we're sitting here. So if we all just need, each play our roles and have this on the agenda, our agendas can only be so big. We only have so much time. We've got families, we've got jobs. Um, but if we can put this as an agenda item at the top, that we really need to focus on it and keep that safety world, like Karen's saying, uh, key. It's it, it's it's not just the safety of the people we're dealing with; it's, it's our own safety. And we also need, uh, amongst ourselves, uh, when we're working in these roles, we need to understand our own social media use. Um, we need to make sure it's locked down privately. We need to make sure we know who is friends on our social media, right? And, and we need to know all these things, and a lot of us don't. So when we turn the camera off, we're going to get into some of that. We're actually going to show some privacy settings here. We're going to walk through all that type of stuff. We're going to go through some real case studies, and we're going to, after we have a little break here, and we're going to actually show 
here's who this is, and we're just going to, you know, talk it out here. Does anybody else have anything? Gino Thrash? Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to have my face on there, it was just going to be a voice. <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to be anonymous. Yeah, he was trying to be anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's frustrating, as all hell, but thank you to you all for trying to blaze that trail. I don't think there's anybody in this room that can dispute that this is something we absolutely have to do for the safety of our clients, for the safety of, you know, trying to prevent future victims and for the safety and improving the lives and the situation of the clients we serve. What's super frustrating is last year, two years ago, I co-chaired the symposium event that we had at uh, Stratford. How many years ago was that? And you presented there, Scott, about this media and taking advantage of social media and communications. And very little has changed with the government. Uh, it, it's so frustrating because we see it and we're being barred from using it and developing it and using it to the extent that we can use it. I had a recent conversation with an assistant deputy minister and our ministry, I believe, is on board, but it's a central government issue. It's a government policy as a whole that we can't do YouTube, that we can't broadcast this stuff. Right? It's not my ministry's decision. So I think what we need to maybe do as an association is look at going and lobbying or educating our, our MPPs that make these decisions because it's not ministry specific. Another, another really good person out there that's at Ontario government level, I know he's independent, but the Ontario Ombudsman, mm -hmm. he's, he's, really, he's really good at using, and his entire team, it's not just him, his entire team is really good at using social media for communications and investigations. Sorry? And the provincial advocate. And the provincial yes. advocate. So, yeah. so I think you could look at some of those best practices of guys mm -hmm. that are kind of a little bit at arm's length from the government. And, yeah. the, the other point I wanted to touch on, Scott, is it's becoming more crucial and visible to me to have this in smaller communities. Uh, you know, without wanting to bash Toronto, there's a lot of services in Toronto. You get to smaller communities and the resources have been diminished through cutbacks and constraints and whether, you know, whatever the other term of the day was. And recently talking to the chief in my community, they've become social services mm -hmm. because there are no resources for them to tap into. They're the only ones that are available 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And the frontline officers don't know who to turn to and what to do with some of the clients they're dealing with mm -hmm. at you know, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And having something like this available where they would be able to reach out in real time in a crisis would be such a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. but I, I, I know of a personal case that happened where you're from uh, two weeks ago where there was something posted on Facebook that there was going to be a suicide and nobody saw it. And, uh, and it, uh, it, it turned out to be suicide. So, you know, and I can, I can tell you that's fairly close to my family. So, um, and, and the worst part about it is, 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 is some of these people that are in crisis are putting this stuff out there and their friends don't know what to do, right? And so nobody does anything. So we're, Amory and I, I think everybody in this room are sold on let's get out there. Let's get out there and give these people something that you can do. Like, we, we could hit into that community where you're from, right? And all we got to do is go through their, like your community, the, the police service there has an amazing social media strategy. You know, like a, a, I, I presented with, uh, with your, your, um, your police officers in Vancouver at the Canadian Association of Police, and, and they were celebrated as the top small agency uh, just a couple of years ago for doing that. So the infrastructure is built. We just need to plug in the social service part. Um, we really need to plug it in and it's not going to create any more work for the people that are doing it. It's going to make our jobs easier and you're going to have to buy phones. You're going to have to buy the right, the, the right, you know, the right laptops and stuff like that. And you know, I don't, I don't pay for my phone. Yes. Do I call my wife on my work phone? Yes, I do. Do I call my kids on my work phone? Yes, I do. And yeah, that's a bit of a perk for, for what I do, right? Um, it's like having a company car. I don't have a company car. I'd have a company phone. And 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 when when crisis comes a knocking, 
I'm there. I, 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 that's my job. That's what I do. And yeah, sometimes it's after hours, but there is a give and take and there is a benefit. And I can give you this from our perspective. Our deputy chief in Toronto Police, Peter Slow, is really the guy that pushed this forward along the, under the, the support of Chief Blair. And uh, our chief was really good about it. And, and one of the things that our deputy wanted was everybody that gets trained to use social media gets a phone. We don't give a phone. It's one of the biggest drawbacks for, for us because our policies and procedures say don't use your own phone. Well, as we're going to see in some of these workshops we're going to do going forward this afternoon, the easiest way to figure out what's going on around you right now is by following Twitter lists for social media for emergency management. And going back to like the G20 or something like that, if you're one of those officers out on the, out on the front lines and, and you want to know what's going on around you, you would just follow it on Twitter on your phone, <laughs> right? And then your safety is enhanced and your ability to react is enhanced and your ability to prevent a volatile situation from happening in the first place by mobilizing appropriate resources is enhanced and that's the same for social services. So I really, really think that we gotta, we have to make this top priority. We say we need to invest in human resources in to do social media, to do it effectively and not from a, a corporate communications perspective, from an operational perspective and communications and investigation needs to be side by side and we need to work collaboratively with our social service partners and our police officers and our and our officials that are assigned for that. Because we could save the life of the, the one in your community. All it takes, I'll tell you right now, all it takes is somebody to contact somebody that's close to that person, whether it be a friend, a parent, uh, you know, maybe their probation officer, um, maybe somebody living in another city that's a family member and say this person's in trouble and they've got a real good connection with them on the phone or something like that. They pick up the phone, they start talking to them, they save their life. That's why it needs to be so integrated. So, like, I, we're seeing them, we're, see, we're losing people every day. And maybe if you, we could end on this one story that I know Anne Marie has about uh, Go Train. Um, and, and then we'll turn this off and have a break. So, can you just tell the story about the, the Go Train? Uh, Josh, yeah. the Facebook one? Okay. Um, as we said, the transit safety officers are now part of our working group. And how they sought us out was that one of the officers. Uh, became involved when someone was struck and killed by a GO train. He knew the individual's name, he searched his Facebook account and he saw on the guy's Facebook account that he had posted, if I don't get my pass, I'm going to walk in front of a train. People had posted, oh gee man, that sucks you didn't get your pass, it's really awful, all these comments, not one person addressed the I'm going to walk in front of a train. So that's Josh Rivet. He's the guy in the picture, and that really, really hit home with him. And he realized that they need to be doing their jobs differently as well. And that's how he got involved with us. And that's how now with that partnership, we'll actually have the availability to tag them in on a suicide and get the train stopped into any area where we could be dealing with someone on the tracks. But it would be even better if a probation officer or a social service worker that's engaged with a client could actually see that first before it gets to the crisis. So that's kind of that's kind of what we're trying to say here. So thanks, uh, thanks everybody. We're going to take a, a quick break here. And uh, all we do is hit stop.